Good morning, PCF family. This is Pastor Merrick Carter coming to you live from lovely Oxnard, California. I pray that everyone has had a wonderful week and um, enjoying life. I know it's been a bit rainy here, and uh, but the sun has come up, but we are expecting the Santa Ana winds to hit us. But I've said it once and I'll say it again. Anytime that you're amongst the living, it is truly a blessing, particularly when you're in your right state of mind. So we thank God for that. Uh, just a couple of, uh, I know that we have the, uh, the loop, you guys are seeing the announcements. Just want to reiterate a couple of things. One, we're having our, uh, our, our communion service today. So if you're local, you know, you, you know, you're cordially invited. And um, we do have our, uh, our, um, our breakthrough meetings on Mondays from 6.30 to 7.30. So you guys, are, if you're local, again, you're, you're, you're invited to that. And, of course, we're having our Bible studies, which is phenomenal. We're having a great, great Bible study, and that's every Wednesday from 7 to 8, okay? So, again, if you're local, we'd love for you to come by if, if, and be blessed with that because we've got some phenomenal teachers. Okay, having said that, um, let's, uh, we're going to take up our tithes and our offering. God loves a cheerful giver. Now, I always make it clear that if you belong to a church, a ministry somewhere, be sure to take care of your church and your pastor first, okay? And then whatever you have left over, and if you feel this ministry has been a blessing to you, we truly appreciate your support. And I do want to thank all of you out there that have partnered with us. We really appreciate it. We truly do. So, uh, oh, also, in order to give, if you want to give, um, we have an a, a app called Tithely. It's an extremely secure app. You can uh, but make sure you annotate on there Pacific Coast Ministries and, um, to make, so that we get it. If you do not put Pacific Coast Ministries, we're not going to get it. And if you've already done this before, it should automatically be there. But I always believe to play it safe and put that in there. Or, of course, you can go to our website, PacificCoastMinistries.com on the home page on the up on the upper part of it you'll see where it says giving you can go that route as well all right so having said that let us pray father we thank you lord for those that are giving and those that didn't give but had the willingness to give father we pray lord the money's received will be used in a mighty way so that we can do all that we can to help build your kingdom so that we all could be the very best we can be for you to reach out to those that are lost Father, we pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I want to invite your attention to Matthew, the first synoptic book of the Gospels, chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. And of course, I'm reading out of the NIV version. Matthew, chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. And it reads as follows. Jesus, I beg your pardon, as Jesus went, on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's home, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I pray that as I break the bread of life that you'll teach and preach mighty through me. And as you do this, those that are watching, those that are here, will be helped and encouraged so that we all can be the very best we can be for you. We pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk from the subject, reaching the spiritually lost. Reaching the spiritually lost. Jesus had done something that was extremely unorthodox in the Jewish faith. And that is he was communicating and fellowshipping with sinners. Now, you have to remember back in that time, tax collectors were frowned upon greatly by Jews because the tax collectors primarily consisted of Jews 
that would collect taxes for the Roman Empire, which was an empire that was extremely oppressive toward God's people. They had overtaxed God's people. And to add insult to injury, the tax collectors would even tax even more to line their own pockets. So they were despised by the Jewish people. They were looked upon as traitors. So there was no communicating with them at all. But yet we find here, Jesus tells one of them, hey, pick up your stuff, come on, follow me. And what did he do? He did just that. And then he, ha he has uh, dinner over the tax collector's home and the Pharisees, which were the religious leaders of the day, saw this and they were appalled. How in the world could your rabbi eat with sinners? How could he do that? And Jesus heard this and then he just laid it on him. <laughs> he said, man, I come for those that are lost, those that are sick spiritually. So um, little did the um, Philippians know, do me a favor, we got something making a noise back there. If you can come back there and just kind of hit the wire a little bit, I appreciate it. It's getting louder and louder, and I don't want to be so loud that it, uh, I beg your pardon, we're having some technical difficulties, but we are going to get through it. But having said that, the ones that were really lost and confused were the religious leaders. You see, you have to understand, back at that time, um, a lot of the religious, uh, a lot of the Pharisees, you had it once, just, no, just hit it up. No, you don't have to push it in, son. Just, there, there, there we go. Tap it up. There we go. Amen. You're my hero. <laughs> Praise God. Sorry about that, you guys. Now, nah, that's much better. Um, the Pharisees, there were, there were some Pharisees that were wholehearted in what they were doing. One in particular was Paul. At that time, it was known as Saul. But there were many of them that were doing what they were doing because they were obsessed with power. They made their religion their God. And it caused a lot of problems. You see, you have to be careful when you are following Christ. You can't lose focus on Christ. In fact, the Bible tells us, you find in Revelation when he was dealing with the seven churches, the church of Ephesus, he, he said, hey, listen, you're doing all the right things. You know, you're, 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 uh, you're, you know, you're feeding the homeless. You've got great social service programs. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing it here. And you recognize false prophets, and you know the word. You know this, that, and the other. And hey, but I hold this one thing against you. You forgot your first love. And I would submit to you this morning, I wonder how many of God's people have forgotten their first love. They've gotten so fixated on their religion. They got so fixated on other things as opposed to following Christ and doing the very things that Christ would have us do and do it out of love. Amen? I have often said the church is a spiritual hospital. Now, let me be, some, I mean, let me be emphatically clear about something. We know the church is your faith and belief in Christ Jesus. We're the church... As believers of Christ, we come together as, as believers and to worship and do what we can to share the love of God. So I need to be clear about that. But often, it has been said that the church is a spiritual hospital and God chose you as a believer in Christ. God wants us as believers in Christ to go out and share the love of God to those that are lost and give comfort to those that may know Christ, but they're going through some difficult times. Amen, somebody. And it's important to understand that uh, before we can do this, God, before God can use us effectively, I should say, there must be a healing within ourselves. 
You can't go out there thinking that you're going to save the world and help people and you are an absolute debacle. You're a mess. We have to get our house in order. Now, let me be clear. The Bible said all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm not suggesting that we're supposed to, if we're going through some challenges in our lives, we're just supposed to just sit back and do nothing. But there comes a time when, as believers in Christ, when you're going through some difficult times in your life, whatever they may be, you may be struggling with your flesh. You fill in the blanks. Sometimes you just have to take a seat and just... Keep praying and, and, and believing that God is going to pull you through this. And not try to do things, and instead of you being a help, you're being a hindrance. Are y'all with me on this? Being a college football coach, I can tell you this right now. It always irritated me when I see a player that is a competitive, which is good, but they're, they're, they're injured. And instead of understanding that, hey, I'm injured, I really can't give what I can give, uh, they're like, they want to go in anyway. And what they do is they hurt the team as opposed to letting somebody that might be 100% that could do more. Why does a per why, do why does someone do that? Because they're thinking about themselves. They're not thinking about the whole picture. Now remember, there's a difference between playing uh, uh, hurt and playing injured. Playing hurt's a different story. You can play hurt. You can only be 70%, maybe even 60%. But when you're injured, forget it. Now, what do I tell the player? Use the football analogy. You just don't sit there. I ain't going to the games. The heck with it. No, you're going to be on the sideline, and you're going to cheer your team on. I've had players in the past that have broken legs, broken arms. They're not, they're, their season is done, but they'll still come to the game. I've seen people wheeled out of a wheelchair on the sidelines. They're there, but they can't play because they're hurt, but they are rooting their team on. Well, what are you saying, Pastor Carter? What I'm su simply suggesting to you, there might be some hurt going on with you, and instead of you engaging in things, you need to sit back and be an encouragement to other people and pray and ask God to whatever you're going through that it heals up so that you could be the best that you could be for God. Can I get a witness to somebody? Does that make any kind of sense? You got people got problems at home. A mess. And that stuff is in you. That when it comes time to witnessing to others, you've got that anger that's there and you don't even realize it. You mean well, but you're causing more damage. And I want to be emphatically clear here. I'm not suggesting that as believers in Christ, we just sit on the sideline and do nothing. I'm, not, I'm also not suggesting that you've got to be perfect in order to go out and do what you got to do and, and, and share the love of God. But what I am saying, there's times when things come up in our lives, we just have to sit back and like, you know what, I need, I need to take some time off. I'm going to cheer my brothers and sisters in Christ, but I got to take some time off and get my act together. I, I'm going to be, I don't want to be melodramatic. I can't go out there I having, you know, I'm, I'm having a, an affair with some other woman. I'm a married man. And I'm going to come up in church and tell everybody, hey, God is good. And, you know, and we, we know we men and, 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 you know, we all have, we all have, you know, desires and we just have to pray and ask God to forgive. That's not going to fly. Yes, God forgives. But I need to get my house in order. Do y'all get, you, you get my meaning. Or I'm there doing drugs. Drinking, drunk. I got a drinking problem. And I'm popping Tic Tacs in my mouth like this door tomorrow trying to cover up the sin. Hey, Amen, somebody. I'm not talking to anybody in there. And yet you're going to go out there and you're going to try and call yourself, well, I'm going to make a difference. No, you have to get your house in order first. That's what I want to drive home, ladies and gentlemen. We must deal with our own stuff before we can effectively deal with others that are hurting. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 7, verses 4 through 5, Jesus says, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a lumber yard? No, I'm sorry. There's a plank in your own eye. 
you hypocrites. First, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Hmm. I've been in church all my life. And there is no perfect place. There is no perfect church. I've, I've tell people all the time, the church stopped being perfect when you set your foot in it. But all the challenges that we may have together as believers in Christ, as a family, there's no other place I'd rather be. It reminds me of Noah's Ark. Can you imagine the stench in that boat? The animals defecated and, and, and just a smell. But I'd rather be in the smelly ark than outside drowning. I'm talking about reaching the spiritually lost. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of people that are lost. And there are some people that are lost. They may be Christians. They may have, have accepted Christ in their life. But they're lost within themselves. And it's our responsibility to go out and to bring comfort and love to those that are lost. You got to remember, whenever you read God's word, when it was written, three things you take into account. When it was written, how it was written, when it was written, Lord have mercy, I've said this all the time. When it was written, who, who it was written to, and why it was written. Today, we have social media. People know about Jesus. They didn't have social media back then, obviously. So what the downside of the social media part is that you have people uh, spreading false doctrines, false prophets getting up claiming this and that and the other, mixing lies with truth, people confused. Amen. Now that, now that we have dealt with our own spiritual hurts, because that's what we have to have to deal with, you just can't. You just can't, again, I want to, I'm purposely being redundant here. Please don't email me or call me saying, Pastor, you know what? I mean, we're always, always going to have problems. Yes. I'm talking about when your issues are to the point to where you know, you know what, man, I need to get my act together. In the meantime, I'm not going to not come to church because I messed up. I'm not going to communicate with my brothers and sisters in Christ because I'm messed up. What it means is I'm going to take a seat on certain things that I would love to do, but I'm not ready for. Amen? Amen. All right. The question is, how do we deal with hurting people? Now that you got your stuff together, this is a key. You find it on your notes. The first thing is, Exercise humility and understanding. Exercise humility and understanding. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Paul said, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is a representative. So when we're dealing with people, we have to have some humility and understanding. And I know sometimes it can be difficult. The humility part should be automatic. The understanding part sometimes is hard. I can tell you through the years, I love people. I'm a people person. I've always been that way. I have this vivacious, gregarious personality. I, I, I think people are, I, I've, I've always been, I'm a socialite. That's my nature, that's my constitution. That's how God made me. I'm an extrovert, where some of you watching me, you might be an introvert. Nothing wrong with that. But sometimes uh, when I deal with people that's going through challenges in their lives, and I scratch my head and wonder, are they stupid? Or, or I don't get it. Why, why would someone want to live a life like that? To myself, I don't tell them that. But then 
the God side of me says, you know what, you have to have some understanding. You don't know what that individual had to, had, what they've had encountered in their lives to cause them to think that way. And the last thing you want to do is helping someone uh, with this elitist attitude. That's the worst thing you can do. What are you talking about? Oh, you know, I'm, um, I'm Dr. Merrick Carter. I'm, <laughs> you know, I've, I've been around the church for many, many years, and I'm, oh, I, I've, I've got this, and I've got that, and, you know, my brother, you're, you're you know, oh, I, I can't believe you're doing that, but uh, I've never done that before, but come on. Have some humility. Be humble. People that go around wanting to help people, but yet they have this elitist attitude, that tells me the individual is very insecure about themselves. Would you all agree on that? Because I don't have to prove anything to you. When people are hurting, they need someone to come to them with some humility and understanding. And remember, all this must be covered with love. And once you have the humility and understanding and understand that all of us go through life with a different lens, it's a lot easier. Because it can be difficult. There are some people you're going to deal with in life that you, you want to help, but it's like they just do silly things that makes no sense. And no matter how much you try to help them, they it seem, it seems like they get worse. But that's when you got to depend upon the Holy Spirit to have his way with that individual. Out there are going to be people you're going to deal with that they're not going to get it. That's okay. You just make sure you do what you're supposed to do. Amen, somebody. Humility and understanding. You got to have some understanding. And there may be a time where you may not really understand, well, why in the world would anyone go through something like this? Why would they put themselves through this? Why would they put their families through, through this? I can't relate, but I know there's a reason for it. And when you talk to them, you talk to them with love, and people can detect when you talk to them that if you have their best interest at heart or not. Amen? All right. I'm talking about reaching the spiritually lost. And how do we deal with hurting people? The second point I want to bring to your attention is be an encourager with patience. Oh, anybody suffer from that? Some people, are there some people that will just push your patience to, to the next limit? Any, can I get an amen? I only got a few people in here. My wife said amen. Looking at me like I'm the one. <laughs> The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, it says, And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle. Encourage the timid. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. I don't think there's a Sunday, there might be a few, but not much, where I'm always telling our church, encourage each other. We need that. But on top of the encouragement, we need to learn, have to learn to be patient. And I know that could be a very diff difficult thing. Now, I'm going to say this, and some of you may disagree with this, and that's okay. I don't pray for patience. Me. This is Pastor Merrick D. Carter. I don't. I pray that God gives me the patience I need for whatever situation I'm dealing with. I don't, I'm not one of these brothers. Well, I'm just going, Lord, just get, I'm praying for patience. Give me the patience of Job. You know, that, no, I'm not doing that. But I will pray for patience to, for a particular situation that I'm dealing with. I'll do that. Because life is hard enough. And I don't want to make it any more difficult. Amen? So we have to, we have to learn to be patient and encouraged. And, and, and again, patience uh, some people can really, really push your buttons, and um, particularly amongst God's people. Because you've got to remember, just because a person is a believer in Christ and they may come to church doesn't mean that they got, they got it all, all together. Everybody has their ways, including you, including me. 
And as believers in Christ, we have to learn to be patient with each other. And when someone's going through some difficult struggles in their lives, whatever it may be, we have to encourage them and let them know, listen, I don't know what you're going through, or if you know what they're going through, encourage them, listen, God's going to work this thing out. You just be strong, and I'm going to be praying for you. You've got to learn to be patient. We live in a microwave society, and we want things done now, and that's not how it works. I'm trying to drop some weight, and, and, and you know, you get on the scale 10 times a day, you ain't going to, ain't, ain't much you're going to drop. Can I get a witness somebody? Y'all ever try to drop weight? <laughs> you get on the scale, and then you, five minutes later, you get on again, like as if you make, you, you're miraculously going to drop what, a lot of weight. No. It takes time. It's a process. There are things about you that you're going to have to learn to be patient about and work on. When you're dealing with people with a lot of issues and problems, you just have to learn to be patient. And I am a firm believer. Um, you have to be honest with people. I've always been that way. And, and again, you can't be honest not giving a rip about them because people pick that up. When people, when you tell folk that they screwing up, that they're doing something that's not going to go well and you're honest with them and they know that you love them and you want them to succeed, the blood is not on your hands anymore. It's on theirs because they can never go back and say, well, nobody ever, ever told me. Be honest with me. There's far too many of us that we want to help someone, but we don't want to be honest with them. We know that there's an issue going on there, and instead of us addressing it in a loving way, we just want to like, well, I don't want, you know, maybe they may not like me anymore. Love is possible when the truth is spoken. Reminds me of a situation I, I tell some folks. It's like you got a booger in your nose. You're talking with the individual, they got a booger in their nose, and you ain't going to say anything to them. <laughs> the people smiling at me. I don't want to say anything because I don't want to offend them. Are you kidding me? I got a booger in my nose. Hey, look, you need to blow, blow your nose. Oh, thanks, man. I'm being a bit facetious, but my point is be honest with people, tell them the truth. And not only do you tell them the truth, let them know that there's a way they can get through it. See, you just can't tell people their faults, you're helping them, and you don't give them any exit or any way to get through it. That, does, that doesn't make any sense. You're dealing with someone that's struggling with whatever, their marriage, their children, their job, their finance, whatever, and you have to let them know, listen, I know you're going through X, Y, Z, but you're going to get through it, and this is probably the way you might want to try to get, get through it. As opposed to, oh, man, we're just going to pray for you. You know, you, you've got issues with your kids, and they're, they're messed up, and I'm just going to pray, pray for you. Well, the question is, why are they acting like that? There's a reason for it. Or you've got problems on your job. Your boss has given you a rough time, and you cannot stand your boss. You dread going to work, and it's causing you sleepless nights, and you're just like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? You know, I'm going to pray for you. And, uh, um, and, but, you know, you might want to stop saying sarcastic things to your boss. That might help a little bit. Amen, somebody. You have to give people a way to go. Amen? All right, let me, let me get ready to cut this thing off here. I'm talking about reaching the spiritually lost. How do we deal with the hurting? How, how do we deal with hurting people? The first thing is exercise humility and understanding. We got that, right? The second point is be an encourager with patience. Be an encourager with patience. And again, I know sometimes that's hard because some people it's hard to be patient with. Even with our own children. Amen, somebody. I mean, you love them, but sometimes they push buttons that, oh, Lord, they cause your frustration to exceed your medication. They're just like, man. But you have to learn to be patient. And last but not least, always keep your spiritual guard up. Always keep your spiritual guard up.
The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it says, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. When you're dealing with people and their issues, you always have to keep your spiritual guard up. That's very important. Especially when you go out of your home. I've said this many, many, many times. Before you leave your home, you need to pray and ask God for protection. How many of you actually do that? Hmm? Don't you know there's power in prayer? Depending on, depending upon where you work, you're dealing with spiritual forces that you are unaware of. You have to keep your spiritual guard up. When you're dealing with people, there's a, there, oftentimes there might be a spirit within them that wants to jump off into you. And, and that, 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 you don't want that. So you have to stay prayerful. That's how you keep your, spirit, your spiritual guard. Stay prayerful and understand this is a very difficult thing. When I see a person in the street that's homeless, I hate to see that. But I'm not going to go around and say, well, I can't say how a person wound up homeless because you don't know because there's a lot of people only one paycheck away from being homeless. You've got to keep your spiritual guard up. You do this through prayer. When you're dealing with people, you never know what you're dealing with. When you go to work, wherever you work at, you keep your spiritual guard up. You're talking to your buddy or to your girlfriend or whoever, and you, you, you know, they're going through some challenges in their lives or some struggles. You want to make sure you keep your spiritual guard up. In closing, I remember this uh, many years ago. Um, I used to work uh, for the Salvation Army at Divisional Headquarters when they were in L.A. They moved to Long Beach, I believe. And um, it was more of a political thing. I, I, uh, you know, I wound up going, working, spending some time in the, in the jails, um, working in the Men's Central Jail. I, I really didn't like that. I was good at it, but I didn't like it. And there were people that I came across um, that even when they breathe, you can sense the evil. Scary. I remember one time I walked in, and I, used to, I didn't work with the general. I worked with those, I can't remember what they call. These are the worst of the worst. They had to be separated from, from the general pop population. And there were some guys that I had really connected with. Uh, some of the guys were ex- or uh, Mof uh, what do you call it, uh, Mexican mafia or assassins, whatever. They were the worst of the worst. And believe it or not, they were the, if I happened to deal with people, they were the best to deal with. General population was like a circus, in my opinion. And there was a couple of guys that I, uh, one in particular just kind of took to me. He was a big dude, man. I remember they gave him, I couldn't believe this, they gave him 34 years he had to come back for some trial thing. They were, they were trying to uh, appeal it. They wanted to give an add on more to it for some stuff that he did. But he gave his life to Christ, praise God, and I believe he was very sincere. And whenever I would walk into this particular unit, all the uh, prisoners had to go into their cell. And I would walk in and I said, Chaplain on deck, Chaplain on deck. Yo, what's up, Chap? Hey, make sure you stop by. Yeah, I got you, brother. I got you, brother. And there was one guy, I'll never forget this. He said, hey, Ch chaplain, are you the chaplain? I said, yeah. Hey, please make sure you stop. I, 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 need, I need prayer. I said, yeah, you got it, man. So I just make my rounds, talk to the brothers, and, and uh, you're really not supposed to touch them, but I always touch them anyway. Hold hands, we pray and talk. Sometimes I have a little mini Bible study and what have you. And I was about to, you know, made my rounds. I was about to walk out and the guy, hey, and I forgot about it. Hey, hey, you, don't, you forgot about, oh, 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 that's right, bro, what's up? And I was talking to this dude, man. I'm thinking there was something about him that was just uneasy to me. And then we got to talking, and I never asked any inmate, you know, what are you in for? It's just one of those things you just don't do. And I don't usually ask the guards because I really don't care. I'm not there for that. 
And he got to quoting scriptures like, man, this dude know the Bible backwards. You know, the Bible says da 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 da. Hey, could, I got I got a court date coming up. Please pray that I could get through this court thing. You know, and 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 I'm saying, oh, okay. But there was something about this dude that was creepy. And my spirit just like, oh. And I prayed for him, and and I walked out. And what I did not normally do, I did. I asked one of the guards. I said, listen, they guy in cell such and such what is he what is he in, in for chap you don't know who he is I said no because I only went like twice a week I, I didn't you know and I can't remember the guy's name but he was he was the serial killer they found he killed all these women I said oh my gosh and I immediately ran and washed my hands and <laughs> I felt the evil when he breathed I felt it Satan is real evil is real and don't you think for one New York second you all that in a bag of chips Satan is powerful he knows the Bible better than we do he's clever and he's sneaky and he often comes at us covertly. His stuff is 90% of the time is camouflaged, mixing lies with truth. And the Bible tells us to, to be ready at all times. Because, you know, when a spirit jumps off of something, number one, as a believer in Christ, you cannot be possessed. I don't want to get off into the weeds with that one there. But you don't want nothing coming on you at all. Period. But as powerful as Satan is, God is all powerful. And as long as we are believers in Christ, we will make it through. There might be some battles that we'll lose, but the war has ultim ultimately been won through Christ Jesus. So you stay prayed up. Don't give up. The Bible says, go ye therefore teach all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Great Commission. And when you go out and you share, and you never know when the sharing part may come out. It may come out when you're in the gym working out, and all of a sudden you're talking to somebody, and you're sharing the love of God. You may be in the grocery store. You may be at the bus stop. You may be on your job. But be ready. Always be ready. Be prepared. And I'm not suggesting you have to be a Bible scholar, but if you don't know one verse, know this, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for who should ever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you could just memorize that one, you're good to go. But remember the two most powerful tools that we have to witness to those that are hurting, those that are lost, is you and your testimony. That's powerful. But by doing this, again, you got to show some humility and understanding. You got to be an encourager. And you also have to exhibit patience. And of course, we must always keep our spiritual guard up. And when we do this, when it's all said and done, we're going to be all right. But in closing, I'll leave this with you. There are some people you're going to share with, they're not going to get it. Don't you get discouraged. You just keep doing the right thing. And in the long run, things will work out for you. Because remember, the prize is not given to the swift, but those that endure. Amen? Amen. All right, listen, I hope this message was a blessing to you and I hope it helped you. There might be some of you out there that you've never accepted Christ in your life as your personal Savior, and you want to do that. For the Bible clear, clearly tells us in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead, you what? Shall be saved. And if you've never accepted Christ in your life and you want to do that, I just want you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner, and I've fallen short. Come into my life, Come into my mind, my heart, and have me be the person you intended for me to be. I believe with all my heart 
that your son Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead for me. I love you, Father. I thank you for your love for me. Lead and guide me where I may be pleasing in your sight. I pray and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you said that prayer, you now belong to the kingdom of heaven and the angels are rejoicing even as I speak. The next thing I would encourage you to do is get you a Bible. We use the NIV version, but whatever version that works for you, get you a Bible. And I would suggest you start reading in uh, the Gospel of John. That's a good place to start. The next thing I would, uh, I would encourage you to do is to um, find you a church home. You need a covering. Now, you may have to visit several churches, you know, um, but that's okay. But you find a church where you feel comfortable, a Bible teaching church where you're going to be fed uh, vegetables, meat, and dessert. Amen? You want to go to a church that you're getting fed, but you also want to go to a church where you're being encouraged and being challenged. If you're going to a church where you're never being challenged, you never feel a little uncomfortable, you're probably in the wrong church. And the next thing you want to do is get baptized. If you haven't been baptized yet, get baptized. Now, does baptism get you into heaven? No, you've already done that through your confession. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward conviction and feeling. That's what baptism is. So I encourage you to get baptized. And um, if you've never been baptized before, now if you were baptized and you were a little kid and you didn't know what it was all about, you just did it out of VBS because your friends did it, get baptized. And the next thing you, uh, you want to do is understand that you've embarked in a marathon, not a sprint. Take it a day at a time. You're going to make mistakes. The key is you repent, you pick yourself up, and you move forward. And as time goes on, you will get better. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's, let's close it out in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for any of the, anybody out there that gave their life to you, Father. I just pray that you lead and guide them. Lord, we thank you for this ministry. We thank you for those that are here. We thank you for those that are watching. And Lord, we just pray uh, what was shared here today will be planted deep in our spiritual minds and heart, Lord, so that we could be all that we can be for you. We pray as we leave this place, grant everybody traveling grace. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Until next Sunday, may God richly bless you and yours.